Some people call the internet the summation of human knowledge. It's everything that we know at our fingertips. So it's no surprise that when this piece of technology came out, we were all enamored by it. The smartphone gave us the ability to connect to human knowledge anywhere we went. So when I came up with the question, I was wondering, what is the next logical step? What comes after the smartphone? Will there be a new form of human connection to knowledge? Ladies and gentlemen, today I want to talk to you about one of the most important trends that is happening around us. I want to talk about wearable technology. I want to talk about how it's going to change our lives sooner than all of us think. I want to talk about why you should start paying attention to it now. The reason is, is when Vanderco started putting together the world's largest database on this particular subject, we never thought we'd uncover data that supports Thur uh, Kurzweil's theory on singularity. We never thought we'd find data that shows an explosion in innovation. We never thought that we would find that we were amongst a new paradigm shift for what and how we learn from each other. So for today, I'm going to take you on a journey through how we uncovered all of this. And it's going to begin with the first wearable device, the wristwatch. So the wristwatch was actually a New Year's gift to Queen Elizabeth in 1571. And it was so large that it was re referred to as the arm watch. But what this was, was that it marked the first point when we started designing technology to be born on the, on the body. In 1644, the Qing Dynasty was the first to miniaturize the abacus, which was a calculating tool used long before our numerical written system. And what the abacus ring did was it gave the merchants and traders of the Qing Dynasty a competitive advantage against other civilizations. Fast forward to the 1950s, we find one of our personal favorites, the button spy camera. And CIA, CIA agencies, you know, CIA, uh, British intelligence, they all created their own version of this. It would be, you know, be worn under a trench coat. But this is the reason why when we think back to the time of Cold War spies, we always envision them wearing a trench coat. <laughs> Next is 1961, was the first wearable computer. Edward Thorpe and his team had created a circuit board that's designed to be worn in the shoe to beat casinos at roulette. That's really cool. But what this was, was the first time a circuit board provided benefit in a clothing accessory. 1979 is where we started looking at the early days of research for modern wearable computing. So Steve Mann is arguably the pioneer of this entire sector. His early research had backpacks, helmets, and as you can see, something. <laughs> but what it was, was the, this research really became the foundation of what we found later on. In 2000, the first Bluetooth headset came out, and it gave us a way to talk on our cell phones while driving. Back in the day when we actually just used to talk on our cell phones. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, right now, all of this is early on. But it was September 2009 when it became commercialized. Okay? The Fitbit tracker was a confluence of innovation. It took connectivity, mobility, connection, communication, computing, all of it, and put it into the device, which could then be sold and made it its way into the consumer space. September 2009, again, was the very first point of commercialization of modern wearable computing. What's really interesting to note, if we look at the 30-year difference between Steve Mann's research and now, what that does is it shows a 30-year uh, generational gap. And what that means is that we could be at the precipice of a mass adoption life, uh, life cycle that we've never seen before in wearable computing. Now let me show you some of the data that supports this. What I have here is a chart that shows how long it took for 25% of the population in the United States to adopt a new technology. So if we look at the telephone, it took 35 years. If you look at the personal computer, it took 13 years. And some of you may actually recognize this chart. It's from, uh, it's from Kurzweil's theory of, on some singularity. He wrote it in early 2000s. What this did is it showed us something called the law of accelerating returns. So what we did as a team, we decided to say, let's update this. Let's put some new market research in. And we put the smartphone. Because if you look at the progression, this is all hardware as it goes along. So smartphone makes a natural projection. projection. So we used this curve to say, where is wearable technology going to be? When you plot that down, 
what the law of accelerating return is telling us, that within five and a half years, 25% of the United States will adopt wearable technology. That puts us at March 2015. It's not too far from now. So hang on to that date, because I want to show you something else. What I've got here is called the technology adoption curve. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, this is the model that best describes how we adopt technology. And data over the last 50 years has shown the world that it follows a normal distribution curve. So what we've done with Edward Thorpe, or Edward Thorpe's theory, no, hold on. <laughs> I'm misquoting someone. Everett Rogers, there we go. Ever Everett Rogers theory in 1961 is we've taken that data and said, okay, let's make it a different kind of chart. Let's take this normalized curve and let's just make it cumulative. Because this is what's being done with the smartphone. And Simcoe did some, work, uh, some research not too long ago to show the adoption of the smartphone. So we took this and we said, okay, let's take data that we can find. So we took market data from I, uh, ABI, PwC, Adobe, uh, Credit Suisse. And what we did is we plotted it and it gave us a time frame. Okay, the most recent data that came out was last week. Last week's data was from PwC and it said 21% is the adoption rate right now. When we put it on the curve, it shows us that February 2015 should be the date when we reach 25%. When you compare that to the March 2015, it's only one month off. So we have data that can show us that by within two years, half of the population in the United States will adopt wearable technology. I know it's hard to understand from a curve what is actually going to happen and what's the impact of that. So what we did is we took all of the data in our database and we took a visualization. We took 9.6 million pieces of data to create comparisons. And we put those comparisons against each other to show relationships amongst devices. And then what we have here is on the left-hand side, the devices that are starting to show relationships. On the right-hand side, we have the speed at which it's coming out. And as you can see over time, these relationships are forming. And what's showing is that we are in the fastest adoption and the fastest innovation of history, of any technology. Now, Apple, Microsoft, Samsung, they've all just started to enter the space. So can you imagine what's going to happen next? I mean, I talked about what it is, but just, just the innovation, the number of devices that have come out, and the way this is forming, and the relationships it's all happening. Can you imagine where it's going to go? Well, I can. And here's why. It all begins with this graph and understanding what is in this graph. There's three main components. The first one is activity monitors. Activity monitors are devices to, that quantify the human body. Next is head-mounted displays. And head-mounted displays are computers on our heads. Now, I know computers on our heads sounds a bit crazy right now, but it's actually quite valuable in the workplace. You have deskless workers who are, who are always using their hands, who need access to information. If you can send it to them, that's very valuable. It makes it safer and more productive. Lastly, we have smartwatches. Smartwatches are, for all intents and purposes, a cell phone and your watch. But they provide the benefits of an activity monitor by creating quantification and analytics. But they also create the benefits of head-mounted displays by creating information flow. So what I'm going to show you next is why, when you uncover and go deeper into all of those, you can actually extrapolate where we're going to move forward. So this is the Gartner hype cycle. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, essentially it's visibility and maturity, how visible a, a particular technology is, and then how mature a techn technology is. So as a technology first come out, everyone gets really excited, expectations go whoop up to the roof, and the peak of exploited, uh, inflated expectations. Enterprises enter, they make some bets, technology doesn't turn out to be everything it's cracked up to be, but the companies that get value continue to invest, and as their successes spread, it rises into the plateau of productivity. So when we took the relationships in those three main points, we div div even deeper. We were able to plot all of the main relationships in wearable technology and where they are, where they're going to be, what point they're at in terms of visibility and maturity. Now, it's impossible for me in the next eight minutes to go through everything. So what I'm going to do for you now is I'm going to talk about only two things. The only two things are quite simple. How is wearable technology going to, going to affect our enterprise life and our workplace? And how wearable technology is going to affect our healthcare system and the medical industry? So let's take a look really quickly here at the two differences. So this is the enterprise. Any aspect of this is relevant to enterprise. And this is medical. The first thing we note is that enterprise is further along the curve. They're just about to enter into the adoption life cycle for enterprise. Now, the first four points all have to do with pushing information 
to a user. The next four points all have to do with pulling information. And the following three have a little bit of a mix to do with communication and to do with information flow and, and safety. Uh, so what's really important to understand is I can make an assumption that the majority of you in this audience all have had their phone buzz in their pocket or their purse today. Now, unless you opened up your phone and you checked into that, you have no idea whether or not that was a text message, an email, Facebook, or some of you maybe using Tinder. Uh, <laughs> The point is, you have no idea how relevant that was or how important that was. What's happening is that enterprise has a unique opportunity to connect their existing safety systems and their existing enterprise analytic systems directly to mobile workers. And they can do that in a hands-free way. They can easily glance, understand how important that is. So what this is going to do is it's going to shift the way we do product management or pro uh, project management, shift the way we do tasks shift safety, shift all of this to the point where we can actually connect all of the millions and millions we've been investing in analytics and create actionable data. Things that can happen in real time. The next is the medical field. The medical field's a bit earlier on, right? And what I'm gonna talk about is mainly around activity monitors. So what we see is there's a new rise of new sensors that are gonna create medically relevant sensor data, medically relevant devices. This is different than it was before because instead of just doing running and heart rate and sleep and calories, we're talking cholesterol, we're talking glucose, we're talking things that you would get at a checkup when you go to the doctor. Now what this is really fundamentally important to understand is that within the next five to 10 years, this could solve our medical crisis. Make no mistake, we have a problem coming the baby boomer generation is an average of 59 years old. As they near retirement, as they get older, they're going to enter the high-risk area. And as they enter the high-risk area, can you imagine what happens when 20% of the population has to go to the doctor every month? We have a serious problem coming. So what medically relevant wearable devices will do is allow us to make more efficiency in data collection. Instead of you going to make an appointment, your doctor will say, I see something wrong with you, come to me. Imagine the data that the entire world is going to have for medical research. Skip out the whole lab process. Throw computer power and supercomputers at this. We are going to learn so much about the body that we have never known before. So what I want to summarize is, is that really the two points that I talked to is just the beginning. We've already uncovered hundreds of use cases with the people we work with. And without getting to any of those, you can start to see where wearable technology is going to make a huge, huge difference and impact. So before I leave, I want to, leave, I want to have you think about one simple last thought. The Seismology Lab at UC Berkeley is currently working on an early earthquake warning detection system. It has the potential to give Vancouver a two-minute warning before our next major earthquake. So what was the reason you didn't check your phone today? How many lives would be saved if we had that two minutes to evacuate this entire audience and the alert was sent to your watch instead? Thank you very much, everyone.